We are live. Welcome to Jojo Rabbit Review and Thoughts. So, yeah, this is going to be a very positive review. And I am going to be making some jokes, but not, not a lot. So, let's dive in. Is it dangerous? Extremely. Now, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the view or thoughts, the part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. So, content warning and or trigger warning. This features ableism, gaslighting, xenophobia, death and killing, suicide, grief and mourning, genocide, bullying, and other abuse. While I personally enjoyed this movie a lot, if you were offended by it, especially if you're Jewish or you know and care about Jewish people, that is valid. And I do want to make it clear, I don't in general think that Hitler and Nazis are things that we should joke about. My father grew up in the years after in Denmark, which was occupied by the Nazis until they lost the war. He has spent his entire life researching Hitler and told me about all the evils of Hitler and the Nazis since I was old enough to understand it. But something else that he taught me is that sometimes we use comedy to pro process the terrible things that happen in history. Sometimes we laugh at evil to make it as unappealing to potential new recruits as possible. I would not be laughing at this movie if it seemed to me to be minimizing how awful Hitler and the Nazis were, how awful neo-Nazis are, or if I for a single second got the sense that it was supposed to make Hitler and Nazis look even remotely like there might be some good to it. Now, let's see. And, yeah, full disclosure, I am not myself Jewish. I do have a lot of sympathy for Jews. And... Obviously, with a movie like this, it brings up whether or not it is right to laugh at Hitler. Not because he doesn't deserve it. There honestly isn't anything so bad that Hitler doesn't deserve it. Now, the argument would be that it is disrespectful to all the people that he had tortured and murdered because he wanted to work out his frustrations. And I 100% understand that argument. If that is how you personally feel, you're not wrong. This is a matter of opinion. And I do want to make it clear, I did not come to this con conclusion lightly. I don't laugh at Hitler without spending a lot of time thinking about whether it is, in my opinion, disrespectful to the dead. But this is going to be a positive review, so that if that is something that you don't want to hear, I 100% respect if you click away from this video. I definitely don't want to upset anyone, other than the neo-Nazis who somehow contort the facts into believing that Hitler deserved anything other than hatred. I suppose this is a good place to make clear I am aware of his troubled childhood. I understand that Germany felt humiliated by the end of World War I, and I do empathize with the regular people who felt betrayed and who Hitler managed to fool with populism and pseudoscience. I pride myself on feeling empathy for pretty much any, every, anyone. But Hitler himself has none of my empathy. You lose that the moment that you choose to take your frustration out on the defenseless, especially to the degree that he did. And it was a choice. There are other people who have or have had power who chose not to take out their frustrations on the powerless. Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, they could very easily have retaliated against people who caused them pain, but they knew that that wouldn't be constructive. They understood that it is not individuals but systems that were the cause of their pain. Hitler gained political power, and rather than try to change the system to ensure that the pain he and others felt at the time was not felt again, he chose to abuse power, take it out on people amass power, take it out on people who had nothing to do with it. Men, women, and children who have absolutely no impact on the outcome of World War One. 
every so often when I talk about a movie where it makes some sense for me to mention something that makes Hitler look especially pathetic, I mean, even more so than he does just from the commonly known facts, I try to do that exact thing. And I'm sure you'll understand why this movie review is one such case. One of my personal favorite things to think of when I want to laugh at Hitler is the fact that sometimes when he lost control of his temper, he would, and this is not an exaggeration, there are eyewitness testimony, he would lie face down on the floor, biting the carpet out of anger. Now, if that image does not make you laugh, at Hitler, nothing will make you laugh at Hitler. Now, the movie is rated PG-13, and so is this video. I'm, I'm really impressed how far it manages to push the PG-13, although that these days they can get away with... Like, at some point, can we just pretend... Can we, can we just stop pretending like it's particularly meaningful? Like, a lot of PG-13 movies are significantly more upsetting than a lot of R-rated movies, so it's just... But, yeah, I mean, there isn't female nudity, and there's, the, the swearing is minimal or mild to moderate rather than severe. So, sure, PG-13. Child soldiers, PG-13. Not as bad as a woman's nipple or more than one F word. Now, I want to make it clear, the it is completely okay to criticize this movie. It is That doesn't mean that you empathize with Hitler and Nazis. And let's see, that brings us to... Right, so, yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to say very many negative things in this, but I still want to start by saying, you know, I am, I am sometimes, I sometimes have points of criticism against movies like this one, but I am a really big fan of the various subgenres this falls into. So the anti-war movies that I especially love all Quiet on the Western Front, both versions. The Bridge, both versions, but especially the old one. Downfall, Die Felsche, 1917, season 4 of Blackadder. Satire about Nazis, The Producers, Allo Allo, and then this. I'm not sure I know any other, which, I mean, it's a sensitive subject, so that's probably, yeah. And, yeah, satire about other sensitive subjects. I... I don't always agree with them politically, but I would, it would be a lie to claim that I don't love every episode of South Park. They all make me laugh. The, the, the most recent one does not play in my country right now, but other than that, yeah. The South Park movie, Team America, you know, uh, yeah, Mel Brooks, History of the World Part 1, every Mon Monty Python movie. And I think all the episodes of The Flying Circus, certainly, if, if I haven't, it's not for lack of trying. And that brings... Holy crap, I left in a lot of... Okay. Yeah, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I'm sure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands in before going out. And, yeah, so there will be no spoilers for this movie, or any movie, in the first, in, in the review part. Once I get into the thoughts, I will put up a spoiler sign, which looks like that, up at the top of the screen. And once you see that, you know, for the rest of the video, there will be spoilers for this movie. If I spoil any other movie, I will verbally warn before I do so, and I will hold up an index finger... If you see me holding up an index finger, that means I'm spoiling something. You just mute and skip ahead. And when you see me lower my index finger, that means the spoiler is over. So, the plot. 
a young German boy in the Hitler Youth whose hero and imaginary friend is the country's dictator. Let's see. And is shocked by a discovery. That's what I'm going to go with. And yeah. So. Right. I suppose I should also say I. Uh, never mind. I will get to that. So that brings. Right. Before I start talking details about technical aspects and such, let me start by saying. This is made by incredibly talented people who are all operating on, like, maximum, like, yeah, absolutely incredible creativity and talent on display here. And, yeah, so this was written by Taika Waititi, who, yeah, he's written 12 movies and he's directed 12 movies. And... Let's see, are they all the same? Um, yeah, uh, as far as I can tell, he's... Uh, yeah. Oh, never mind. Yeah, there are a couple of... Yeah. He hasn't written absolutely every single thing. And the book was written by Christine Lunens. And... Let's see... Yeah, the the writing is really good. The 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 movie is very different from the book. I haven't read the book. I haven't. I don't have access to a copy. But the you know, it's a very good sign when the author herself actually says, you know, this was a. Let's see the. <clears throat> I have a direct quote here from her. I've seen film adaptations so faithful to the book that they somehow ended up unfaithful, in essence, despite the well-meaning intentions. And... Yeah, you know, basically, she thought that it was a really... Yeah, she... She... she you know, he didn't he didn't adapt the book very directly. There are a lot of differences. And there you know, other people who are on YouTube have gone into those differences. And the book sounds amazing. I would like to read it. The but yeah, if this is a case where the adaptation changed some things because the person writing the adaptation felt that it would be beneficial and you know, basically, the, the, you know, he gets the, the, some of the most important points about, you know, it's not one of those things where, oh, they just didn't understand, so they cut out a lot of the original. And, let's see. Yeah, one of the inspirations for doing this movie Taika Waititi read that 66% of American audience, holy crap, had never heard of or had no knowledge of the Auschwitz concentration camp. With Jojo Rabbit, he hoped the memories of the victims would forever would remain forever and that conversations about the topic would not stop. And yeah, that, holy crap, I, I read that like weeks ago when I was researching this. I had forgotten it was that high of a number two-thirds that is absolutely horrifying but yeah you know I, th I think this movie is a really good yeah you know and and yeah because it's PG-13 you can show it to teenagers you know it's not only adults who will be able to watch this so I do appreciate that and yeah this was also directed by Taika Waititi, and the other movies that he's directed that I've watched are Thor Ragnarok and nothing else. I would like to watch 
what we do in the shadows. As right now, Disney Plus has the show, but not the movie. Even though the movie came first, I don't. I don't know what they're what they're doing with the. I don't understand the order in which they add these things. I, I feel like maybe they're just trolling. Like they're saying, well, let's. Uh, if we if we dangle it in front of them, maybe they'll show up later to check if the early they had both both of the Alien vs. Predator movies before they had any of the Alien movies. Yeah, I I know I've said that before, and I'm not. It's gonna take a while before I can let that one go. Anyway, yes, part of the reason I watch this is because Thor: Love and Thunder is coming out. You know, what? what is that? A month from now, I guess? I wanted to make sure that I'd watched as much of his work as I could. And this, I, I don't know why. This is the only... Yeah, this and Thor Ragnarok are the only two movies directed by Taika Waititi that are on Disney+. Plus. I, I, I do not understand. It seems like several of the others would make perfect sense for, like... Anyway... But yeah, he also does a really great job on direction. And let's see. And Mel Brooks, you know, he yeah, he praised this film in his speech at the AFI Awards in January 2020. And this is a direct quote. I just saw Jojo Rabbit, and it's really a terrific and eloquent and beautiful picture. That is great. He is exactly the kind of industry person you want to impress with something like that. That that's, yeah, high five. That's that's awesome. And let's see. Yeah, so, I've seen some people say that it is bad that the movie has both like absurdist humor. And also these very, like, heartbreaking things, you know, that, that it's a, it's a, there's some, there's some tonal whiplash. And I definitely, I understand where they're coming from, and I, yeah, there's probably at least some truth to it. I do think that, like... You know, what, yeah, and some, some of the people say, you know, Mel Brooks, you know, the producers did not go back and forth. It was absurdist all the way. I think it's extremely important here to look at what the two directors were trying to accomplish with their two movies. While clearly both of them wanted to make Nazis appear ridiculous, pathetic, you know, we're meant to laugh at them never identify with them, never consider the cause as potentially having something good. Taika Waititi made a movie that can be the first thing someone watches that is about Nazi Germany. You know, a number of the atrocities are either stated outright or very heavily implied. And after all, we do still have the producers. We can watch that, seriously. We should. It's hilarious. It's amazing. We, de we don't really need a movie that's extremely similar to it, you know. I would agree, like, let's hypothetically say, and I really hope this never happens, let's hypothetically say that there were no copies of the producers, that the only way for anyone to watch the producers would be if we remade it. I would definitely think we should make a remake, 100%. I don't think that that means that this movie shouldn't also, but that's another thing, like, it's not, we're not running out of film, you know, we, we have enough. The, the making this movie doesn't mean that we can't make movies that are entirely like and yeah I want to say nothing in the movie overstayed its welcome no character no scene no running gag nothing everything was just there for as long as it needed to be like there were some things you know when when you hear people talk about them like, it sounds like it'll be a way bigger part of the movie, and I was a little worried that it was going to get to be, like, ex excessive and just feel like, okay, we get it, let's move on, please. But the, the, 
you know, yeah, I should I should say, I don't have a problem with extremely detailed accounts of the atrocities of World War II. I think Schindler's List is an absolute masterpiece, but this isn't that. This is a more like this is supposed to move a lot faster. And yeah, I thought it did, you know, and, and now like thinking back to like, I, I heard some people talk for a really long time about just things that in the movie, like if you just look at them, they're actually very short, but that's because they made such a strong impression on them. And, and you can, you know, sometimes a scene that's very short, you can talk about it for a long time without repeating yourself. That's one of the, strengths of filmmaking it can convey so much more than just verbal yeah so basically the opening of this movie is jojo receiving a pep talk from adolf his imaginary friend modeled on hitler and i actually yes i should specify in this entire video whenever i say the name adolf I am specifically referring to the character in this movie, which is the imaginary friend of Jojo, as played by Taika Waititi. If I say Hitler, I'm talking about the historical Hitler. If I say Adolf, I'm talking about the Taika Waititi character. Yeah. The opening is Jojo receiving a pep talk from Adolf, during which they both say Heil Hitler, I guess... A dozen times each or something like that and then he runs out of his house runs down the street going Heil Hitler to everyone which you know as, as I saw a reviewer point out it was basically hello you know they, they did say it all the time so it yeah which you know the the movie yeah the the yeah He's, you know, he's running down the street, going Heil Hitler to everyone, running, smiling, excited, which helps defang those two words and that gesture, but also shows that to a typical 10-year-old German boy during Nazi Germany, it really was second nature to say that. At the time, it was essentially like saying hello. And and it's also just like, a, you know, if, if you, if to you, if you haven't watched this movie, if to you the words Heil Hitler bring to mind, like, massive armies of, of, you know, SS, you know, Nazi forces, then watching this movie will, you know, I, I think at least the idea is to make it that this is what you think of. When you, when you hear the phrase Heil Hitler, you don't think of something scary. You think of, you know, this, this quirky looking 10 year old boy you know, and, and part of it is also that during the pep talk, he says it a lot of times where, well, maybe not a lot, but he says it several times where it's not very impressive, you know, and, and each time Adolf says, what are, you, what are you doing? You know, you're overthinking it or, just, you know, just throw it away, throw it, you know, casually, you know, and it just... You can't hear those words the same again, ever, ever again. After seeing a 10-year-old practice in front of a mirror how he says, well, I guess, uh, okay, not facing the mirror, near a mirror. Practice saying Heil Hitler and being self-conscious about if he's saying it right. Because that's what the imaginary friend is. You know, he's he's a reflection of himself. So, yeah, he's like... Oh, man, Hitler would think I was doing a terrible job. You know, Adolf, talk, talk me through this. I'm, I'm going to get, you know, a Adolf is like, we're going to get, you're going to get there. By the time we've, you know, we've gone over this, you're going to get there. You're going to be ready to say Heil Hitler exactly the way you should. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's never, those two words are never going to be the same after this. You know, it, it really is just going to, yeah. And the, yeah, the opening titles, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and just quote a fellow critic here. 
Though I came in a little skeptical, I knew the movie had me during the opening credits set to a German version of I Wanna Hold Your Hand with Nazi propaganda clips edited to look like Beatlemania. It's impossible not to see a Wes Anderson influence in YCT style, but to me there's a trace of Paul Verhoeven vibe there. 100% agree. People don't want to see you earnestly wag your finger at the ills of the world, so instead you act like you're celebrating the gasolinists, shoving it out there like it's a fun consumer product we all enjoy. Hopefully that makes us squirm. And 100% agreed. And that's like it. It's, yeah, actually another excellent satire about Nazis is obviously Starship Troopers. And just in general, I'm not saying every single movie he's made is, is great. I watched Kyle... Ah... I don't know if he still wants to go by Brows Held High because he he did some research and found out that it's actually like this really ugly racist like phrenology thing. Kyle from Brows Held High went over the the Dutch movies that Paul Verhoeven made before Starship Troopers. And for sure, some of them seem very suspect. So I'm not gonna I'm, watch his video. His, he's he. It's one of his videos about Starship Troopers, you know. And yeah, but Starship Troopers, Total Recall, RoboCop One, and sometimes I would also point to Basic Instinct at just movies that really have something to say. And, like, he manages to make it, like, you can watch those movies and only see the surface. Only see, oh, you know, it's popcorn entertainment. Or you can look deeper and there's really something there. I, um, Maggie Mayfish did a great job talking about Basic Instinct. I am afraid I forget which video it was, but, yeah, absolutely incredible. In general, her content is incredible. So, I'm not going to give away whether the ending of this movie is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. I think the ending is pitch perfect. And not to be confused with, actually, yeah, I think, come to think of it, isn't that... I think the the that one Australian comedian in this is also in that. Anyway, it's perfect. There is no Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. And, yeah, this movie never lost my interest. I was thoroughly gripped from start to finish. And it's worth noting that I knew almost every single detail going in because I that was the choice I made when I did my research. You know, I heard what everybody had to say about all the different things in the movie. I watched hours worth of other people's videos, read a lot of reviews. I think I read every single review I could get. Oh, actually, yeah, there were some that I didn't get around to. Anyway, it was still incredibly effective. Uh, yeah. And... Yeah, it, it does what good satire does. You know, it... It doesn't so much... It doesn't really misrepresent the subject... It just changes the context, changes the perspective on it just enough that you can see that if you actually examine the subject, there are some things about it that are ridiculous. That brings us to the character. So Roman Griffin Davis plays Johannes Jojo Betzler, a young German boy is a member of the Deutsches Jungvolk, which translates into German, I guess, young folk, young people, something like that. I did not think to write an exact trans. I don't. I don't speak German. But yeah, the the I'm I'm I am deeply impressed. He gave an absolutely amazing performance, and. Yeah, Taika Waititi explains in an interview that since his character is the invisible friend of a 10-year-old, then he must have the mind of a 10-year-old himself. 
Honestly, I'd like to add to what he said that a lot of the things that Hitler believed in and told people to believe in were ideas that only 10-year-olds should believe. Like, no one above that age should actually believe this stuff. And, you know, if there hadn't been a death penalty for openly, you know, like, like Sophie Scholl and the other members of the White Rose were literally executed for spreading pamphlets, you know, so yeah, that's why a lot of people either believed or at least claimed to believe. And yeah, uh, there's a very sweet relationship between Jojo and his mother Rosie. And yeah, right, here we go. Yeah, Scarlett Johansson plays Rosie Betzler, Jojo's mother, and yeah, I, I I haven't seen her in very many comedies. I know she's done other comedies, don't get me wrong. I haven't personally seen very many of them, but yeah, like she's, like people, she is legitimately hilarious. Like, there are MCU bloopers and interviews and such where she just, she's incredibly funny. She is a very gifted comedian. It's just that a lot of people think of her as this, like, beautiful woman, as someone who does a good job playing tough roles, as someone who's good in action roles and such. And she is all of those things as well. But yeah, she's legitimate. Like, if you if you heard some jokes that she had made and you didn't know what she looked like, you would be thinking of her as a comedian before, you know, that, that is the, the, the thing. You know, a, beautiful women have a harder time convincing people that there's more to them than beauty. But yeah, she's, she's incredibly funny elsewhere and in this she's she's she is absolutely like gut bustingly funny in this movie and there's also this warmth and sweetness to her where yeah you know it is this thing the there are issues but she tries her best to be a good parent and it doesn't exactly help that it is just Jojo and her. You know, they very early in the movie, they, you know, the, the, we're told that his father is in Italy fighting for Germany and his sister died. So, and, and, you know, we're, we're told very early on, he really doesn't have very many friends. So, you know, she is the, the, yeah, the, the, a person who can help take care of him. And yeah, Taika Waititi as Adolf, Jojo's imaginary friend. And, yeah, before I, I just, I, I apologize to you, to myself, for the following, but I just, I feel I have to, I, I, there was, I, I came across someone online who, who wrote, Stalin would have been better, I'm guessing some parody to make fun of, but Taika probably likes him. Okay, so I've never heard anything Taika Waititi has done or said that would at all hint that he would have any positive emotion towards Stalin. Although, I suppose, I don't know everything he's said or done. And without a doubt, we should all hate Stalin. He was an absolute monster. Every dictator is. But if you're wondering why Taika chose to make fun of Hitler over Stalin, it might be because he's Jewish, you utter moron. How is that... That's not a difficult concept. You really shouldn't be wondering why a Jew would hate the guy known for 
having six million Jews executed for trying to eradicate every single Jew on earth that that might make them more holy crap now yeah almost every to get back to the yeah almost every single thing that Adolf says is incredibly funny there are things that I I would say everything he says that is meant to be funny is funny and since Adolf is only in the mind of Jojo he can't actually affect the world at all which sometimes he has trouble accepting and will shout in powerlessness as something that frustrates him which is something that the real Hitler did again we have eyewitness accounts of it and it is something that can be a release of tension to laugh at him for and it's also something like if you tell a child you know Hitler would sometimes shout when he couldn't get his way even though it wouldn't change anything that's something anyone can can find funny you know that's that's pathetic. Like, that's, oh my, oh my god, to quote a character in this. That is just, oh my, yeah. And that's, again, that's something a child would do. Yeah, there's a, there's a part where, ah, is that a spoil? Ah, crap. Okay, yeah. So, this is somewhat of a spoiler for the movie. But yeah, I have to quote this joke. There's a part where Jojo and Adolf see, I guess I'm not going to say what character, but they see another character burning something. And in Hitler, you know, in, in Nazi Germany, you know, like if you or I burn something, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily something bad. But like the character burns some kind of paper. So, okay, there's something there, you know. And Adolf, nobody can hear Adolf but Jojo. But Adolf, like, looks at it and he, he can't quite see. So he, he goes, what are you burning? Uh, what are you burning? And Jojo's like, I, I can't hear you. What are you burning? <laughs> and it's just, it's the most ridiculous thing. It's like, he just, he just told you. Yeah. No more spoilers for the time being. Sam Rockwell plays Captain Klenzendorf, Captain K, an army officer who runs a Jung Volk camp. And he is just so good. He yeah. The the I'm gonna yeah, according to IMDB trivia, in addition to having a dialogue coach to learn the accent, he watched classical and veteran actors like Marlon Brando, where he finds an Oscar Werner to portray World War II era Germans, and then decided ultimately his character would be more like Bill Murray or Walter Matthau with a German accent. You, that really shines through. I, I had actually forgotten, but yeah, there's definitely some Bill Murray going on with the, yeah. And it's like, I mean, I... I like to say Iron Man 2 is the only time I didn't like Sam Rockwell. I just wish he had played it smooth, which I don't think was completely his choice. I think the I think it was that director can't believe I'm blanking on his name, but yeah, the John Favreau. He directed him to be more goofy and kind of you know, ri ridiculous and such, but yeah. He's he's so good, and he's so good in comedies, so, yeah. And, yeah, Rebel Wilson plays Fraulein Rahm, an instructor of the League of German Girls in the Young World Camp. I'm told that Rebel Wilson only ever plays one character. I mean, she has that really brief part in the first Ghost Rider movie. I think other than that, this is the first thing I actually see her in. Like, I've seen clips of stuff she's in. I thought she was incredibly funny here. I, I don't know, maybe I'll check out some of her other movies. Because I've, I've heard people say that in this, she's still playing that same kind of character. I don't know, I guess I thought it fit. Alfie Allen plays Freddy Finkel, second in command to Captain Klenzendorf. I think it's the first thing I see him in. I gotta see him in more stuff. He was really great. And their relationship together is, is great. And Stephen Merchant plays Hermann Dietz, a Gestapo agent. Now, yeah, the... the um, 
Yeah, the actor thought Waititi's blend of humor and tragedy was seamless, comparing its satirical style with that of Dr. Strangelove, which, yeah, there's definitely some of that going on. And, yeah, it just, like, I don't think I've... Every single thing I know Stephen Merchant that I've seen that he was in, he was incredible. You know, there's this, there's Logan, there's Portal 2. It's hard for anything to, to, ah, what's the word? To, to reach a higher level of esteem in my mind than Portal 2 because he is so unbelievably funny in that game, but he was also incredibly funny here, and he has just, I mean, some of his lines, wow, it's like, that is so funny, please never say something even remotely resembling that again, please, I'm begging you, never again, and just, yeah, so, so good, just, yeah, and, and, it, you know, yeah, YTT cast some people with great comedic instincts, you know, there's a, there's a lot of talent that goes into telling a joke. Comedic talents don't always get the, the respect that they deserve. But it really is. Yeah, he yeah, he and others really have great... Like, they, they know how to... Exactly how to deliver these lines to make them especially funny. Archie Yates plays Yorkie, Jojo's best friend, fellow member of the Yumvolk, and he's so supportive. I've seen a lot of people call him scene stealer, and I mean for sure the the there's a lot. Yeah. He's he's very, very memorable. And a lot of the things he says and does are incredibly funny. And there are a number of cameos that I am not going to get into here. Wikipedia lists some, yeah. And... Yeah, so I've seen some say that this movie is not as good as The Death of Stalin. Very few movies are as good as The Death of Stalin. This one is still really, really good. I, I'm i not currently planning on an actual video review of The Death of Stalin. But if, like, if you know very much, like, you need a little bit knowledge of Stalin and the people closest to him when he died in order to fully appreciate it but it's it, it's it's an I, I it's hard for me to put into words how funny that movie is and how just absolutely spot on it it's just ah it perfectly highlights exactly what a just ridiculous situation of a dictatorship ends up in if enough time passes and the the dictator gets enough bad ideas and there are too few people like i mean you you couldn't really say no to stalin but and yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it would have really worked to say that you agreed and then go and not do the thing. He would probably check. But yeah, just like after a while, it was it was a mess. It was absolutely ridiculous. There's this part where because it's, yeah, it's called the death of Stalin. Not exactly a spoiler. So Stalin is ill. So they have to get him a doctor. But the last time they they tried to find doctors they got like the best of the doctors because stalin was worried that they were gonna i forget if it was killing him personally or he was insanely paranoid like everything was plotting against him in his mind so they they drive around they they get some doctors and these doctors are like 
So now I'm going to be executed too. I I thought it. I thought they were done executing doctors. You know, they don't. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being a doctor and someone comes by and says, the the most, you know, the the guy with the most authority in the entire country told me to come get you, and your first thought isn't has something happened to him? I'll I'll render aid to him or. Whoever close to him is, you no, know, your first thought is, what did I do now? So I'm going to get executed too. You know, just, it was, it was a complete mess. And the movie is so good at poking fun of it. It is intensely quotable. It is driven by amazing performances by some of the greatest comedic talents. Just, if you haven't already, it's just, you know, go to Wikipedia, read a little bit about the the you know the people closest to Stalin when he died, and then watch the movie if at all you if if you have the stomach for it, and that one is definitely an R, and it is it is very very dark. It is not for the faint, faint hearted, whatever you know. But but otherwise, watch it. It is it is absolutely amazing. And. Yeah, and the, the characters tend to behave, both written and performed, in a way that makes sense based on what we know about them, what we learn about them. And... And that brings us to the cinematography, which was handled by Mihai Malamer Jr., who has 19 movie credits total. And yeah, in addition to Jojo Rabbit, they did The Hate You Give, A Walk Among the Tombstones, The Master. Yeah, so, so movies that are known for being very well shot. And yeah, the you know the cinematography keeps it easy to follow when something suddenly happens. And the movie does not have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. And there's actually there's a lot of bits where like something really intense will happen, and the camera is very close to Jojo, who or, or whoever it's happening to, and instead of shaking the camera or quick cutting, which would make it harder to follow, they they actually have the camera resting on the subject for as long as they can without it like slowing down the action. There was never a time in this entire movie where I was confused about like the geography of you know what is what is happening kind of thing and the editing was handled by Tom Eagles and right he also edited Hunt for the Wilder People and What We Do in the Shadows so he worked with Joe Dash Taika before and yeah, the editing does a really great job keeping it easy to follow fast moving scenes and keep more calm when that is called for. I was also very impressed by like very often when the uh, when there's something that's intense, the movie will build up tension instead of being in a rush to get to the like the, the release of tension, you know, it will spend a lot of time really building up the tension, and yeah. And yeah, I'm going to quote a full critic here. The director cleverly doesn't show us certain things, and a lot of good choices were made in the editing room. And yeah, the special effects are, I mean, just about seamless. I don't think there was really any time... Like, there were times where I looked at something and I was like, that didn't happen for real. They did not actually put an actor through that. But 
I don't think there was a time when I looked at an effect and I was like, that didn't look convincing, which, you know, I love the MCU, but I'm not going to pretend, you know, sometimes some of the effects don't completely hold up to scrutiny, even in some of the very most recent ones. But yeah, it's, you know, so it's not like it never happens today. It's not like you, you know, you press a button on the computer and it spits out a perfect effect. You know, basically, yeah, so, yeah, something that helps is that it tends to be, like, there are a couple of really, like, distinctly absurdist sights in this, but a lot of the time it is basically set in the real world, like, there, are, you know, some things will happen where it's like, okay, that must have been staged somehow, but, yeah, it's, it's not a super effects heavy, it doesn't feel like an effects heavy movie. This was made on a budget of 14 million US dollars, which, yeah, it, it doesn't look like they were, like, that sounds really limited, but yeah, they, they managed, they put it all to good use. And the box office was $90.3 million, so yeah, that's, that's a, that's a success, that's what, you know, not to not to overwhelm you with jargon here, but that is what in the movie industry is referred to as a success. And yeah, so the movie was filmed. Par parts of it were filmed in the Czech Republic, and yeah, and and that works really well because that does look like what Germany looked like back then. In, in some places. They still had to dress up and stuff. Dress stuff up. But, yeah. And... Yeah, so the costumes... Apparent... Like... Waititi did research and... Found out that actually... They had... Like... You know, a, a lot of movies about World War II will use these more drab colors for the costumes, and that makes a lot of sense most of the time. But here, yeah, the, they have these very... It, yeah, I'm, just, I'm gonna quote... It matched the kind of clothing people wore in that area, according to his research. He also wanted a design that symbolized the joy of childhood. Bright, vivid colors stressing the ambition to contrast typical historical films. Rubio interpreted... Uh, Maze C. Rubio, who worked... Yeah, the costume designer, interpreted these as Italian neorealism, neo a filmmaking style popular in the 1940s. And the... the no other World War II movie looks quite like this one. And that is... A major compliment. I've seen quite a few. I've I've seen dozens. I may have seen. Can't be a full hundred, can it? So several dozen at least. I, I think it might be a f fifty or more. So the score was handled by Michael Giacchino, who also. Uh, Let's see, he, yeah, worked on Spider-Man No Way Home, Into the Spider-Verse, and, yeah, Alias and Lost, and, yeah, you know, when it calls for, when, when the following is called for, the score is soft, sensitive, there's a lot of string instruments going on, and, let's see. Yeah, the the uh, yeah the the I already mentioned that the you know I want to hold your hand by the Beatles is you know there's a German version played and yeah the the 
I'm going to go ahead and quote Wikipedia. While watching documentaries on the Hitler Youth during research, Waititi noted similarities between the crowds at Hitler's rallies and the frenzy at Beatles concerts. Also, the Nazis were all about taking credit for things that were not their achievements, so if they had still existed by the 1960s, they would definitely be claiming that they made up this pop music unless it was banned outright. Giacchino helped secure the rights to the song by contacting Paul McCartney, with whom he had previously worked. And yeah, there there are other songs. I am not going to give them away here. The the yeah, the just the soundtrack, the the licensed music is so well chosen. It uh, yeah, and the way it's used absolutely perfect. I guess this is where I should say pitch perfect. And there are some excellent decisions made in sound design and like audio editing. I guess I can't really give there's a there's a part where something like really dramatic is is said and like the audio underlines you know not not like Handholdy, excessive. So, yes. Right, uh, one of my fellow critics pointed out. Uh, right, yeah, so, quoting some fellow critics here. The movie features black comedy, verbal comedy, slapstick, absurdity, and anachronisms. The movie's strength is its absurdity. And the movie doesn't do the Marvel thing of having a funny thing happen to undercut something serious, which. I was very relieved because I that Taika has done some of the absolute worst. The the Thor the Thor Ragnarok has some of the worst of that. And so I forgot. Ah, yeah, I'll just real quick. Here it is. Yes. So the movie is an hour and 43 and a half minutes long without end credits and 49 and a half long with them. You don't really have to watch the end credits. If you feel like you know, stopping the movie at that point, that's fine. <clears throat> and... Yeah, so... The best element of the, the movie, to me, is a tie between the anti-hate message and the mocking of Nazis, including Hitler. And, um, worst aspect, I'm not, there isn't very much that I could really point to as outright bad. Um, I don't know, I guess, uh, could have done a better job of not looking like a Wes Anderson movie, I guess, I don't know. Now, the worst aspect, according to others, is that it's too sentimental, and while I disagree, I can definitely see where they're coming from. And yeah, the most, the thing I was most worried about was definitely jokes undercutting sincere moments. And the thing I was most looking forward to were jokes at the expense of Nazis and Hitler. This is a movie that is going to really... It's its an emotional... Uh, it's intense. And... Yeah, like... Um, don't watch it, like, right before you have to, like... Be around someone who you don't want to be upset around you know if if yeah if you're like if you're celebrating something don't watch this right before watch it afterwards or something uh, I would not say that the trailers give too much away and the trailers you know give you a good idea of what the movie is like the cover and posters also do not give too much away and also give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like so, the, yeah, on YouTube, I found a number of clips, two trailers, and let's see, I don't think there were any fan ones, 
a music video, which was fan one, many review analysis ones, and a couple of like behind the scenes and documentaries and, and such. There was a lot here on YouTube. And yeah, it makes sense that it's inspired a lot of people to... Yeah, there are a lot of different things to talk about in the movie. The tomato meter, this has an 80% on the tomato meter based on 425 reviews, a 94% audience score based on over 5,000 verified ratings. The consensus is Jojo Rabbit's blend of irreverent humor, humor and serious ideas definitely won't be to everyone's taste. But either way, this anti-hate satire is audacious to a fault. And yeah, of the 425 reviews, 340 of them were positive. And the average rating was 7.60 out of 10. And the audience, the the average score was 3... Or wait, ah. Yeah, 94% gave it 3.5 or higher. And the average rating was 4.6 out of 5. This is, this is a popular movie. On Metacritic, it only has 58 out of 100. But the user score is 7.9 out of 10. The last user reviews appear to be from March 27th of 2020. And yeah, 57 Metacritic reviews, 196 user reviews. On IMDb, it has 1,769 user reviews. Of which I read the top 100, the, the the 100 voted most useful, and yeah, just to briefly the of of the 100 voted most useful, three of them were one out of ten, two were two out of ten, four were three out of ten, three were four out of ten, nine were five out of ten, seven were six out of ten, three were seven out of ten, nineteen were eight out of ten. 25 were 9 out of 10, and 32 were 10 out of 10. So this is a very popular movie from, from most accounts, yeah. And the IMDb external review section had 435 links, which I did not get through, and I think you'll understand why. But yeah, the, the user rating is 7.9 out of 10 based on... 365,954 users, 33% gave it an 8, 21.4, a 9, 18.9, a 7, 14.5, a 10. And yeah, not very many people, statistically speaking, a very small number of people gave it less than 7 out of 10. So yeah, that is yeah, and it let's see it won one Oscar and there were 49 wins and 193 nominations in total. I decided against copying in all of them. So at, once again, I'm sure you can understand why. Yeah, the movie pushes the PG-13 in order to show the horrors of war, which helps I I thought that I was going to end up feeling like it was still very limiting. I don't know exactly if, if it was the studio or if it was Taika or who exactly made the decision. I I mean, if, if one of the main inspirations for Taika... Yeah, since one of the main inspirations for Taika was that two-thirds of American millennials don't know about... Auschwitz. I'm guessing he wanted the movie to be able to be shown to teenagers. So, yeah, I, I honestly ended up not feeling like it was particularly limited. Now, the... Yeah, so I give this 10 jokes mocking Nazism out of 10. 
I guess if I had to be 100% objective, it would be an 8 out of 10. I, you know, I it, honestly, I could sit down and watch the movie immediately, even though I literally just got done watching it. Yeah, it's it's incredibly rewatchable, and yeah, I I I I definitely gotta watch it again. The, the, these days, I don't watch all movies more than once, but this one definitely, yeah. Actually, yeah, I I just realized I didn't say before in this video. This is my first viewing, and I started recording this video pretty much as soon as I was done watching the movie. And yeah, that is it for the review. That brings us to the thoughts sections. And I'm just really quickly going to note the time codes. Yeah, so the rest of this video contains spoilers for the movie. Notes taken while watching. Right, uh, yeah, this section is, in, you know, thoughts in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. I like how Adolf looms by JoJo at first, like at the very, very start, and uh, like the, the audio is like, it it sounds like there's some there's a, a sense of danger there, and then he ducks into frame, and he's got this big goofy look on his face, and he's like, "You're you're gonna be great. You're gonna be a great little Nazi." When JoJo's running around hiling everyone, I love how none of the adults are as into hiling as he. Like, they'll they'll do it, because if they don't do it, they, you know, if, and someone sees, they might get executed. But it's like, eh, 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 I'm I'm not actually gonna do the thing this way. I I guess I'll, yeah. So so they'll just do like this. It's you know just yeah okay whatever kid. You know get get out of my way. My life is really difficult right now because of Hitler. I don't want to be reminded of him. Can two-eyed people do this? Excellent summary of the insecurity that drove Nazism. Again, that that is not an accident. Like they could, he they didn't have to make that. In, you know, yeah, the insecurity is on full display, and and you know, Fraulein, I'm, I forget her name, Rebel Wilson. If she's if you know, everybody says, oh, she's just playing Rebel Wilson. Fraulein Rebel Wilson is like, okay. Calm down there, you know, just, I, th I think she says, Jesus. In the montage of them doing Nazi stuff, every so often Jojo will look like he really isn't enjoying, like almost kind of questioning, you know, he isn't enjoying himself. He's maybe even questioning what's going on. And like, he can't quite keep, keep up, you know, he doesn't like the brutal stuff, like the fighting. Also, they smell like Brussels sprouts. Oh, right. I forgot about the Brussels sprout bit. There's so many imaginary things to remember about Joes. And the teenagers try to push Jojo into killing the rabbit after they spotted him running away during the fighting. A bunch of bullies picking on someone who can't defend themselves. Perfect metaphor for Nazism. I love that Fraulein actually tries to give Jojo a gun. Like, you know, the... the you know, Jojo, bless his heart, he's like, can I be conscripted? You know, Fraulein is like, you can you can carry the conscriptions, you know, so, so that he'll have something to do. And he's like, is there any chance I could be conscripted? And she's like, oh, yes, I give you absolute permission to send my 10-year-old off to war. Please, let's let's get him a gun. And Fraulein walks over like, gun, gun? And, and you know, hand, hand, trying to hand the gun to, to Jojo. And Rosie's like, could you get that? And and Fraulein said, no, no, the gun, the gun's for him. Holy crap. And that is, and again, that's such a perfect, because they kind of did put guns in the hands of, like, at least teenagers. Yeah, very close to the end of the war, they did put guns in the hands of children and say, go defend the town. You know, it's absurd, and and to have it out in on full display like this is just 
perfect satire. Words cannot describe how much I love that early on Elsa has filmed them lit and her scene staged like a horror movie character. No wonder he thinks she's a ghost at first. Like, you know, you, you hear something up in the attic, that, like, that right there, you know, it, obviously Jojo doesn't realize he's, that briefly he's in a horror movie because you never want to investigate a, you know, he, he is not listening to Ghostface whatsoever, you know. And he goes up there and, you know, spots, the, oh, there's this thing, you know, cuts it with the knife and, and gets the, the flashlight. And, you know, you've got this really creepy, like, cut-off doll's head. And, like, when you think back to it later, it's like, I mean, maybe that's all she had left of the doll and she still wants to play with the doll. Or maybe maybe it was Inga's and it's, whatever. But, you know, slowly comes and... and gradually pans up across her and she's completely in the darkness this is you know and and it is also hilarious like she's just like hi you know and he screams like he just like saw you know just this absolutely it's yeah in incredibly funny and and then you know he runs out and then she comes out and and she moves her hands down the the what's it called, the, the stairs thing, you know, and and gets all up close to him, and, you know, there's that bit where, yeah, and she, you know, physically overpowers him to, to keep the knife, and she points out how he, you know, he can't call the Gestapo, and it, what was it, he can't tell his mother, I, f I forget the exact details, but yeah, you know, she points out he can't, you know, and again, when you later on think back to it, it's like, of course she did. She, if he tells someone she's going to die, of course she's willing to intimidate a 10 year old to stay alive, you know, but yeah, it completely plays into how to him, you know, the Jew is this horrible, horrible, you know, yeah, just to a Nazi, the the Jew is basically like something out of a horror movie. So they actually imitate it and point out how ridiculous it is. Because it's she's just like seventeen year old girl. She like she doesn't look that like fierce. And that was also something I was very impressed by. Like I want to say her name is Thomas and Mackenzie. I. I'm not 100% certain if I've seen her in anything else before. I, I kind of got her now. She's an incredible job here. But yeah, this, like, at times she can be very sweet and, and tender. But then at other times, you know, she's got the knife to him. And she's like, I, what was it? I am descendant of people who fought giants and angels. There are no weak Jews. You are following a man who can't even... A pathetic little man who can't even grow a full mustache. You know, just, yeah. And and the, you know, F, F, after the first time, the, the you know, he goes up there and it goes wrong. He tries to go up, you know, she has his knife, so he gets another from, from the kitchen and goes up there with this, you know, like, yeah, this, this other knife and goes up to close to where the, the opening is. And, and basically lays out how he wants things to go. And then he asks, okay? And then she comes up from behind, not okay. <laughs> and she's like, gets the knife and just, yeah, it's just, it's so funny. And it's like, it didn't occur to him that she had maybe left the room, you know, and, and every single time after that, every time he goes into the room, he has this chair up against the wall across from the crawl space and he sits in it with his back against the wall so she, he is not going to have her get behind his back ever again that is not a thing that's going to happen you know and and the you know after after he leaves adolf is like stop giving her knives you know and then later when rosie comes back you know, she she opens a, a drawer in the kitchen. And it's like, where are all the goddamn knives? <laughs> and.
and after his mother comes home, Jojo stands watch, worried that Elsa is going to hurt his mother, which was also, like, this, mo this movie really understands when to humanize what characters, because, you know, Jojo, he comes at, like, he's, he's, okay, there's the, the element of self-defense, but he also comes at a 17-year-old girl with a knife twice, you know, so, okay, maybe the first time he was worried it was going to be something else, but the second time he knows, so, yeah, so, yeah, you know, he, seeing him standing, like, he when, when she's taking a shower, a uh, bath, she, you know, he's standing watch, when she's, like, getting dressed for, for, you know, he's basically thinking the moment that mom comes home, Elsa is going to hurt her, maybe even kill her. Also really love the scene where Elsa and Rosie talk, and that also, you know, it is extremely important to humanize Elsa after the horror movie introduction she got. And Jojo was awake, so he knows for sure that Rosie helps Elsa. And the Fraulein works on Jojo's back. And she has some choice comments about his leg and face. So it's not just that she doesn't understand sarcasm with the gun. She really does not appear to understand the concept that sometimes people will say certain things to avoid saying something else. I like the detail that when Jojo talks to Captain K about Jews, Finkel shares his flask with him, which... You know, the, the, as far as I understand, it is not just interpretation. Canonically, Captain K and Finkel are supposed to be gay lovers, you know. And, yeah, they, they, we have these little, it's also the way that they talk when, you know, he's like, I, I meant that we needed dogs for the, for when the, the town is attacked by the other side. I did not mean for you to get actual German shepherds, you know, and, and Fink was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, and you know, Kay is like, oh, it's, it's a stupid name, it's okay, it's okay. You know, the, the, clearly there's something more going on, which is part of why Captain K has more sympathy for, you know, clearly he knows that, you know, he he is aware that Elsa is not Inge, but he keeps pretending and, and, you know, even directly tells Jojo right before he dies, take care of your sister, you know, be, just in case someone is listening and, and might still, you know, do something. Because some people were, some people were killed for going against Hitler right before the ending of, of World War II after it was clear that they were going to lose. And, and, and that is, I suppose, yeah, maybe not everybody is what, Hitler also went heavy after the, you know, gay, gay people. And the, the so, so yeah, you know, a, a gay Nazi is an oxymoron and it's, it's the kind of, you know, it's not like he could say, oh, I, I guess I can't be, you know, he, he can't go to the authorities and say, I can't be in the army, I'm gay, you know, they're going to put him in a concentration camp if he, if they find out, regardless of who it is he finds out, you know, yeah. Oh, also, oh, God, I really love that bit where, you know, the, I, I think, yeah, they're talking about the book, and Jojo says something about mind control. And the Fraulein overhears, and so she's like, yeah, Jews can mind control people. I had this uncle, and a Jew mind controlled him and made him gamble and have a drinking problem and an inappropriate relationship with my sister. And finally, he died in an unrelated drowning accident, and it was all a Jew's fault. And it's, it sounds ridiculous to us but that's really what they thought like i i believe it's a direct quote direct translation the jew is behind all our problems something like that you know and people believed it because they just they needed something to hate they needed 
something to believe, you know, they needed to believe that things could be better, you know. I'm really glad that Taika Waititi made this movie, especially in the current climate, because it, we really are looking at, like, there are way too many people who use rhetoric similar to the Nazis in politics in America today. On the right. I love that now that Jojo is out of knives, which his mother confirmed, asking where all of them are, his weapon of choice is like, uh, I want to say it's a ladle or something, just, he, lo he looks absolutely ridiculous carrying the thing as, as if it's gonna be, yeah. And I, I really like how, you know, she's like, also, we are definitely allergic to a food, so if you wanted to kill me, that would be the best way. And she lists all these food items. And at first, Jojo's like carefully writing down every single one. And then after a while, it's like, very funny. Which she is. She is very funny. And the letters from Nathan go from being really heartbreaking to kind of sweet. I, I really do appreciate, like... This is not one of those perfect kids in movies. This is a kid who sometimes makes mistakes and acts very selfishly, but it is, yeah. I've, I've he was very realistically written and and acted. And the book may have started out as Jojo thinking he could help Nazis like Captain K but it clearly develops into an excuse for him to spend more time with Elsa, get to know her more. The scene of the Gestapo searching the house, I mean, in reality, what is it? Five or seven minutes of screen time, but holy crap, like, you just, it's, I knew the outcome going into the scene, and I was still tense, you know, it's like, it's just a, it's a gut punch. It's, it's so unbelievably, like, tense, and, and then when, 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 when Elsa has to hide them all, it's just so uncomfortable, and it just, yeah, and it's such a good, like, she realizes at some point they're going to look up there. If they find the room in the wall and her in it there is nothing she can say or do that will keep them from executing her but if she puts on normal clothes and then walks down and claims that she's inga there's some chance that they're going to accept that you know better take that chance than uh, yeah and just literally everything Dietz says. It, oh. The line, I, I don't want to repeat it. I don't want to end up on some kind of watch list. I just want to say that the thing he says right after walking into the JoJo's own room had me in stitches. And I really let, like, it was, it was so ridiculous when he's standing, like, he's towering over Captain K. I, like, I know how tall each of these guys are in real life. Like, I don't think anybody thinks that there's actually that much of a height difference. I, I mean, it's got to be like, maybe Rockwell was, like, kneeling down or something. Maybe, could, could Dietz have been at, uh, uh Merchant have been on boxes, maybe, but I I loved it. It was especially because nobody like you would almost expect Deets to say, "Wow, I didn't realize how short," you are. but no, he's just standing there, towering over this guy, like <laughs> like he, he's towering over Captain K, like he's no taller than JoJo is, you know, and. Adolf does get legitimately intimidating when he starts ranting at Jojo after the Gustavo search. They do some effect to his voice to heighten the impact. 
excellent job. And Jojo finding his mother having been hanged is heartbreaking. And, you know, he tries to stab Elsa, the physical embodiment of his mother's kindness, which got her killed. And despite how physically dominating she was towards him earlier, you know, she does hear, see, he's hurting. So, you know, she doesn't, like, like, you know, at least twice earlier, she, like, grabbed him and held him, and he couldn't break free of her grasp. Hypothetically, she could do that, and it might be a safer option if she doesn't want to get stabbed again, but she realizes that this is not the, the time for that. I also really like the acting. When, like, you know, when she sees him come in, at first it's like a smile of recognition. They do now enjoy each other's company. You know, maybe he's going to say or do something silly or maybe even sweet. But then she realizes there's something wrong, so she kind of braces for that. Like, and when Elsa and Jojo are looking out the window, talking about their parents, you know, Jojo expresses he believes that his mother hated him since he's a Nazi, she wasn't, and it got her killed. You know, this is a way, this is the way that a child thinks, and it's important to confront that. You know, Elsa points out, rightly, he could have gotten in trouble if he knew about what she was, yeah. That's also, I, I don't think I said that earlier in this video, but Taika Waititi made this in part as a, you know, a tribute to how much parents, especially single parents, do for their children. And, yeah, it's it's absolutely true. Every single time Jojo goes outside in the movie, we see at least one sign of the war going badly, and they get increasingly difficult for him to ignore, despite how good of a mood he is in early on. But then here near the end, it's completely impossible to ignore. Excellent montage of time passing. I thought the, the couple of... Like, there at the start when he... Let's see. I want to say he, like... He zips up something or buttons something or something. They they do a very Edgar Wright montage thing, and I don't know. I mean, if he, I think there were like two of them in the entire movie. If there had been more, I would have been like, okay, come on now, you're you're, this is getting excessive, you know. Overall, do I prefer Edgar Wright to Taika Waititi? I mean, it's not really fair. Ultimately, I can't really say. Uh, okay, okay. If I absolutely had to, I would say Edgar Wright. But I'm not sure Edgar Wright would have made as good of a satire of Hitler and Nazis as this is. So anyway, and I like how supportive Yorkie. You know, good for you, Jojo, a girlfriend. The war scenes are intense and absolutely harrowing. And again, like, it's it's not very much screen time, but it just feels like you're being slowly dragged through just absolutely horrifying, yeah. And the first and last scenes of Adolf mirror each other. In both of them, Adolf is trying to encourage Jojo, asks him to give a Heil Hitler. But where in the first one, Jojo takes the encouragement, the final one, he instead kicks him out the window, and yeah, it's it's. Let's see. And and you know the ending also has several really emotional gut punch, like when he says the Germans won the war, yeah. But it is very sweet when the two of them dance at the end. And that brings us Yes. So the final section notes taken before watching. So yeah, I just briefly want to say if Taika Waititi wants I, I don't really want sequels, but if Taika Waititi had more things more historical things that he wanted to to comment on like this 
I would love to see more. I think he has more in him. This one is kind of the, you know, if you're only going to do one, this is the one. Again, you know, he, uh, I'm, I'm not sure he practices Judaism, but he grew up Jewish or his family's Jewish, something like that. So, yeah. Okay, no more politics. Dinner is neutral. Table is Switzerland. Table is going to accept Nazi gold? What does that have to do with anything? Now, yeah, I... Uh, yeah, so I'm going to quote a uh, fellow critic here. The particulars of the evil can seem curiously abstract, and the portrayal of goodness can feel a bit false and forced. Elsa's Jewishness has no real content. She exists mainly as a teaching moment for Johannes. Her plight is a chance for him to prove his bravery. So a female character is turned into a tool for a male character story. Very frustrating when that happens. And it's especially messed up because Jews were used as a tool by the Nazis. And now this Jewish character is used as a tool... You know, at least it's a tool for good, but it's still, yeah. And and I saw someone else. Let's see, there was the. Um, let's see. I'm gonna see if I can find it, and I I simply cannot. Um. Um Okay, so the yeah, the thing was the uh right, right. <clears throat> that oh here we go yeah the film is tech quoting a fellow critic here the film is technically starting from the same premise that racists are working on that marginalized people have to work to prove their humanity that is an excellent point that is a problem okay i'm just very briefly going to read aloud somebody actually wrote this somebody committed this you know not to paper to internet paper. 3 out of 10. In the end, they are making Nazis ridiculous and US soldiers liberate countries, so it stinks of propaganda. Imagine thinking the film wouldn't do that and thinking it shouldn't. Like, obviously today, American soldiers, it's no longer, you know, now it's about oil. But back then, it was about liberating countries. I did see someone say that, you know, it, it portrays the, the Russian soldiers in a very negative light. I mean, I don't think that it's... I guess an argument could be made that it should point out that they were, like... Russian soldiers did some terrible things to German, you know, people during the war. Soldiers and civilians alike. But Germans also did terrible things to Russians. So it was not really... Yeah, I, I honestly, I think it would have been good to have one of the Russians just briefly say, this is what you get for what you did to my sister or something, you know. Now... Yeah, near the end of the war, Germany did actually use teenagers to fight the losing battle, so the climax is actually somewhat historically accurate. And apparently children did learn about Nazi weapons in the Nazi scout camp in real life, but there would be adult supervision, which they do try to do in the movie. You know, basically the movie points out that it's not enough to have adult supervision because you can't, you know, so you might not be able to you know, be quick enough to, to stop. Yeah. And
and let's see. Yeah, and you know, at the start of the movie, you know, Adolf makes Jojo feel more confident. But later Jojo comes to realize all the things that Hitler has told him about the Jews, about the war, simply are not true, and so he loses his faith in him and starts to only see what even the Nazis have to admit are the negative aspects of Hitler. He let them into a war they lost and abandoned them at the end. And, you know, I I really love that bit where he says, people used to say a lot of mean things about me. And then he says, like, two or three things, and, like, yeah, that is what they said, and they were right. You know, uh, he's, he's crazy, look at that psycho, he's gonna get us all killed. So, yeah. And I really, really love that at the very end of the movie, once the war is over, the final release of tension is not violence, but dance. Celebration. Because that's not, you know, think about, like, they could, it could so easily have been, it, it could easily have ended on another note of, oh, ridiculous Nazis. Which, again, I love that a lot of the movie is ridiculous Nazis, but it would have been wrong if it just ended on, like, yeah, let's say, you know, one of the bullies that, that bullied Jojo and gave him the name Jojo Rabbit. Imagine if, like, one of them was, like, let's see. Yeah, yeah, like, he's being, like, some American soldiers found him and are, like, pushing him ahead, maybe shooting at his feet. And he's, like, crying and, and begging them to stop, something like that, you know. That might have been funny, but it, 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 yeah, it's not about, you know, once, once the Nazis are out of the way, we celebrate. We don't keep going over the, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And Jojo arguing with, Hit, with Adolf is him gradually leaving Nazism as he questions it when Elsa disproves the things Nazis have told him to believe about Jews. Adolf gets increasingly disturbing the longer you get into the movie, going from encouraging Jojo to berating at him, shouting at him for being a bad Nazi. And I actually read that some, you know, audience goers recited a quiet prayer in during that scene, which, yeah, makes a lot of sense. And... Let's see... That is absolutely everything that I had for this video. So hit me up in the comments section below. Let me know what is your favorite satire movie, favorite satire about Nazis. Do you think something should have been done differently about this movie? Are there other things in history that you think would be, you know, really ripe for making fun of and yeah the yes if you like this video please thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell there should be a link to my main channel page one two more links to stuff like relevant playlists a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now i put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler filled thoughts on the current episode of a Star Wars Disney Plus show, which these days is Obi-Wan Kenobi. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want my more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoy watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.